Hello everyone and welcome to this new gen webinar sponsored by Domain Therapeutics entitled Innovative Technology for Insights into Receptor Tyrosine Kinase Biology. I'll be your host for today's presentation, Jeff Bogaliskis. I'm the technical editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, which is going into its 40th year providing unique and exclusive coverage for all aspects of the life sciences industry. In a previous webinar last month, we heard about the capabilities of the Biosensor platform from Domain Therapeutics with respect to characterization of GPCRs. Today, however, we're going to learn more about this unique Biosensor platform and how it's being utilized to study receptor tyrosine kinases, which regulate a host of cellular processes such as cell growth and differentiation. An ever-increasing number of studies have also shown this receptor's critical role in the development of various cancers. Unfortunately, many current modalities utilized to study receptor tyrosine kinase activation are limited in the data that they can provide during the drug discovery process. Our presenters today want to show you a different way to interrogate receptor tyrosine kinase biology and expand the drug discovery efforts into this important signaling molecule. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Laurent Sabag is Associate Director for R&D and Head of Biology for Domain Therapeutics, where he is currently leading discovery projects on GPCRs in immuno-oncology and CNS disease. Today, Dr. Sabag will provide an overview of receptor tyrosine kinase biology and its role in various disease states. Dr. Sabag will then turn the presentation over to his colleague, Florence Gross, who is a Research Associate at Domain Therapeutics, where she develops new biosensors to study the signaling and trafficking of receptor tyrosine kinases, as well as characterizing GPCR signature profiling using the Biosensol platform. Today, Florence will highlight the capabilities of Biosensol and show us some data from the platform's use in characterizing receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. But before we begin, I want to remind the audience to stick around for the Q&A session that will occur right after the presentations. Don't be shy, send in any question you might have for our two presenters. It's really easy, all you need to do is click the Ask a Question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and hit Submit. We're gonna to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Okay, now with all that said, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Laurent and Florence. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. My name is Laurent Sabag, and I'm the Head of Biology at Domain Therapeutics North America. Today, my colleague Florence Gross and I will present a breadth-based biosensor technology that allows a better characterization of receptor tyrosine kinase biology and pharmacology. I will begin with a general overview of receptor tyrosine kinases, their activation and signaling, as well as the different mutations that are found within this receptor family that have been described in diverse cancer. Florence will then provide an overview of the Biosensol RTK biosensor technology and its different applications to study RTK signaling and pharmacology. At the end of the presentation, Florence and I will be able to answer your questions, which you may submit during the presentation. Let me start with an overview on receptor tyrosine kinases. There are 58 receptor tyrosine kinases that have been identified in humans, which have been clustered into 20 subfamilies. All RTKs have a similar molecular architecture with an extracellular ligand binding domain, a single transmembrane helix, and a cytoplasmic region that contains the protein tyrosine kinase domain, in addition to carboxy terminal and membrane proximal regulatory regions. The overall molecular structure of RTKs, their mechanism of action, and key components of the intracellular signaling pathways that they trigger have been highly conserved throughout evolution. Furthermore, RTKs have been shown to play critical regulatory roles in many cellular processes, such as cell growth, differentiation, and survival. Given the important role of RTKs in various cellular mechanisms, mutations in these receptors and aberrant activation of their intracellular signaling pathways 
have been associated with cancers, diabetes, inflammation, severe bone disorders, and angiogenesis. Thus, a better understanding of RTK signaling combined with new technological tools will improve the development of a new generation of therapeutics that inhibit or diminish aberrant RTK activity. Receptor tyrosine kinases are cell surface receptors that respond to growth factors and other locally released proteins through their ligand binding site. Consequently, this leads to the dimerization of the receptors and the initiation of downstream signaling events. The first event that is triggered is receptor autophosphorylation on multiple tyrosine residues in each RTK in the dimer through the receptor's intrinsic kinase activity. The tyrosine phosphorylated residues in the cytoplasmic tails of the receptors allow the recruitment and docking of different signaling proteins containing SARC homology 2 domains, referred to as SH2 domains. Multiple SH2 containing proteins can bind at the same time to an activated RTK, triggering multiple intracellular cascades, leading to many cellular outcomes. Here is an example of the recruitment of the SH2 containing GRB2 adapter protein to an activated RTK, in this case EGFR, following its activation and autophosphorylation of multiple tyrosine residues following ligand binding. The SH2 domain of GRB2 binds to the phosphorylated receptor, which brings along other effectors such as SOS, triggering the cascade of RAS activation. This in turn leads to the activation of the RAF MAF kinase and extracellular related kinase ERK. The active ERK then phosphorylates various cytoplasmic and nuclear targets. This is just one example of the extent of signaling events that is triggered following ligand binding to the receptor and the recruitment of a SH2 containing protein. You can appreciate from the figure on the right that there are multiple SH2 containing proteins that are recruited to an activated RTK, such as SHIC, PLC gamma, and SHIP2, among others. The recruitment of these SH2 containing proteins have an impact on angiogenesis, survival, proliferation, differentiation, migration, and invasion. Thus, the ability to profile RTK pharmacology with new technological tools has broad implications to many areas of biology and health. As you will see later during this webinar, these SH2 containing proteins were used to develop the breast based biosensors to study RTKs, which will be described by Florence. Given the role of RTKs in many cellular processes I described earlier, it is not surprising that mutations in RTKs lead to the development of cancer. In the next two slides, I will describe the different types of mutations that have been identified in the EGF receptors. In non-small cell lung carcinomas, several mutations have been described in the tyrosine kinase domain of the EGF receptor, as shown in the upper right figure. Following the development and clinical application of first and second generation of EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as gefitinib, activating mutations in the receptor were identified, which were responsible for acquired resistance to treatment. Third generation irreversible EGFR inhibitors were then developed targeting the point mutation that substitutes methionine for threonine at amino acid position 790. This mutation was found in approximately 55% of post EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor treated patient samples, as highlighted in the pie chart. However, a substitution of a cysteine for a serine at amino acid position 797, was later identified in the tyrosine kinase domain of EGFR and was reported to be a leading mechanism of resistance to the third generation irreversible EGFR inhibitors. Therefore, developing the tools to investigate the impact of these mutations on different aspects of RTK biology and also screen and characterize the next generation of tyrosine kinase inhibitors is essential to better understand the consequences of mutations 
on RTK function. The most common tumors with EGFR mutations are glioblastoma multiform with 27% mutation frequency compared to different cancer types. Unlike non-small cell lung carcinomas I described earlier, glioblastoma multiform had five times more mutations in the extracellular furin-like domain than the tyrosine kinase domain, which represents a different class of mutations. These somatic gene mutations can be classified by their oncogenic effects and predictive significance, as shown in the bottom right figure. Approximately 26% of EGFR mutations were oncogenic, 11% likely oncogenic, and 8% predicted oncogenic with glioblastoma multiform being the cancer with the highest number of cases according to the findings in this published study. Later in the webinar, Florence will describe the impact of such mutations on signaling and receptor trafficking. Florence will now describe how we use the biosensal technology to study the binding of different ligands to the same RTK, revealing different signaling responses, the impact of different acquired resistance and intrinsic mutations on the recruitment of signaling proteins, their trafficking to different cellular compartments, and on the efficacies of different inhibitors. Hello everyone, my name is Florent Gross and I'm a research associate at Domain Therapeutics North America. It is with great pleasure today that I'm going to present the details of our dynamic web-based biosensor technology that allows for multidimensional analysis of RTK signaling and pharmacology. I will also provide specific examples of how the biosensor RTK biosensor technology can be employed to study different aspects of RTK biology. The RTK biosensor platform is a quantitative live cell enhanced by standard bioluminescence resonance energy transfer EB breadth based biosensor platform that allows for real time mapping and monitoring of the signal transduction pathways engaged upon the activation of RTKs. Importantly, Contrary to other available RTK signaling assays, our new generation of sensors presents the advantage of not requiring modification of the receptors. The biosensor platforms include an array of biosensors for monitoring SH2 proteins mediated downstream signaling of RTK. Assays are based on translocation of biosensor components to the plasma membrane and other endosomal compartments. These biosensors are designed to measure receptor proximal events that are engaged upon receptor activation. To date, we have developed biosensors that monitor the activation of 12 distinct SH2 domain containing protein listed here. In addition to proximal biosensor, the technology includes sensor enabling detection of distal effector activity and second messenger generation. The later assays can be used to complement and or confirm events observed with proximal sensors. The red biosensor to study GPCR signaling were initially developed by a Quebec consortium of Canadian academic researcher led by Professor Michel Boubier and Dr. Christian Leguil in collaboration with Drs. Gracila Pinheiro, Stéphane Laporte, Derry Hébert and Richard Leduc from the University of Montreal, McGill University and University of Sherbrooke. This original work was supported by the investment from the Consortium Québécois sur la découverte du médicament, CQDM, and the technology was then in-licensed by Domain Therapeutics in 2013. The biosensors at the heart of the technology are based on bioluminescence resonance energy transfer, BRET, specifically enhanced bystander BRET or EB BRET. BRET is a naturally occurring proximity-based phenomenon involving energy transfer between a bioluminescent donor, such as luciferase, and a fluorescent acceptor, like green fluorescent protein. The donor and acceptor are each fused to different protein, 
represented by A and B in the illustration shown here, or to different parts of the same protein, depending if one is interested in detecting protein-protein interaction or conformational changes. In the presence of oxygen, luciferase catalyzes the oxidation of its substrate, celanterazine, with the concomitant emission of light. When the luciferase is less than 10 nanometer away from the acceptor through interaction of protein A and B, for example, forced resonance energy transfer occurs such that the acceptor protein absorbs the energy emitted by the luciferase substrate reaction and in turn generate a fluorescent signal at a specific wavelength. The final response is expressed as a breadth ratio calculated by dividing the acceptor emission intensity by the donor emission intensity. The EB breadth approach used to generate biosensors differs from conventional breadth in two main ways. First, EB breadth uses luciferase and GFP from Rhinia reniformis as energy donor and acceptor, respectively. This naturally occurring donor acceptor pair transfers energy more optimally than pairs used in standard breadth, resulting in improved assay windows and sensitivity. Second, the acceptor in our EB breadth system is actually not fused to protein, but anchored to a specific cellular compartment instead, such as the plasma membrane or the endosomal membrane. Consequently, these interacting chromophores were exploited to develop new, highly dynamic, bread-based trafficking sensors designed to monitor the trafficking of various HH2 domain-containing proteins specifically interacting with phosphotyrosine residues in the cytosolic tails of active RTKs. Events can be detected from gross plasma membrane and early endosome compartments. The proximal biosensor forming the basis of the RTK biosensor platform contain a specific SH2 domain of the previously named proteins fused to Renia luciferase, RLUC2 or R. The recruitment of biosensor to the plasma membrane upon RTK activation translates into an increased breadth efficiency with a plasma membrane anchored Renia reniformis RGFP or G. The same translocation principle is used to measure the internalization of RTK with an early endosome anchored RGFP. I will now provide some specific examples of how the technology can be employed to study different aspects of RTK signaling and pharmacology, especially focusing on spatial trample signaling, the impact of mutations on RTK signaling, the use of red in microscopy and application on multiple RTK targets. In the three next parts of this presentation, EGFR is going to be used as a model receptor to demonstrate the spectrum of applications of the eb bread based biosensor platform in studying RTK biology and pharmacology. I will start by describing the different aspects of EGFR signaling that can be studied in terms of spatial temporal signaling and the mode of action of inhibitors and antibodies. EGFR is part of the RB receptor family that includes R2, R3, and R4. The RB family of peptide growth factors comprise seven members, such as EGF, amphiriguline, and epiriguline. EGFR is involved in key biological processes, and its deregulation is associated with the development of many cancers. In fact, EGFR is highly implicated in tumor invasion, metastasis, and angiogenesis. Its overexpression has also been observed in a broad range of malignancies such as breast, lung, and brain cancers. Moreover, as mentioned in the introduction, intrinsic and acquired mutation of EGFR 
have been described to modify receptor signaling and or to be responsible for the appearance of drug resistance during treatment in a clinical setting. EGFR is known to recruit multiple SH2 domain containing effectors after being stimulated. It allowed us to follow the activation of multiple pathways such as MAP kinase, AKT, and PKC pathways. We used here the SH2 GRB2 biosensor as GRB2 is well known to interact with EGFR to activate downstream the MAP kinase pathway. A receptor titration was performed to evaluate if responses were receptor dose dependent. Following a 10 minute stimulation with EGF of X cells transiently transfected with different amounts of EGFR plasmid, ligand induced SH2 GRB2 recruitment to the plasma membrane was monitored. A receptor dose dependent and ligand dose dependent increase in breath signal were observed following ligand addition. Importantly, no effect was observed in the absence of EGFR transfection. The largest assay window was obtained with 500 nanograms of EGFR, quantity of receptor, which was therefore used for all subsequent experiments. The recruitment in real-time kinetics of SH2 GRB2 effector at the plasma membrane or at the early endosome was then followed after stimulation with EC50s and EC80s of either EGF or epiregulin. Measurements were recorded every 30 seconds over a period of 60 minutes. Epiregulin displayed faster kinetics of SH2 GRB2 recruitment at the plasma membrane compared to EGF. We were also able to highlight a spatial temporal bias as EGF, but not epiregulin, promoted a, a time-dependent increase in SH2 GRB2 levels at the endosomes after 20 minutes of ligand stimulation. These results are in agreement with published evidence showing that epiregulin does not promote EGFR internalization. In addition, binding of different EGF family members to the same receptor have been reported to stimulate different biological responses, that is, bias signaling. In this example, we demonstrated that the ligand signature also depends on kinetics and compartments. Using a panel of five biosensors consisting of the ARLUP2 tagged SH2 domains from GRB2, SHC1, PLCG1, PI3 kinase, and GRB14, we compared the effects of three natural EGFR ligands, EGF, epiregulin, and amphiregulin on the recruitment of the SH2 domains of these proteins at the plasma membrane. We showed here the capacity of the biosensor to differentiate unique signaling signatures with different ligands, as these three ligands display differences in terms of efficacy and potency. Indeed, EGF was more potent and efficacious than epiregulin and amphiregulin on all the represented pathways. Using the same five biosensors and the same three EGFR ligands, we were able to detect four or five of the SH2 biosensor at the early endosome compartment after an hour stimulation with EGF. In contrast, no response was obtained upon epiregulin or amphiregulin stimulation. This highlights the platform's capacity to follow the trafficking of RTK biosensor in two different compartments, from the plasma membrane to the early endosomes, and to reveal internalization selectivity or bias, which can be observed with different ligands on the same receptor. We then evaluated the effect of gefitinib, an EGFR-specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor commonly used as a first-line treatment for some types of breast and lung cancers. We first treated transfected cells with increasing doses of gefitinib for 30 minutes and then added an EC80 of EGF for 10 minutes for the plasma membrane recruitment and for one hour for the early endosome translocation. Recruitment of SH2 GRB2 SHC1 and PLCG1 to the plasma membrane or the early endosomes was inhibited by gefitinib. 
Of note, these values were comparable to data previously reported in publications and using other methods. Thus, the RTK platform allows us to assess the potency and efficacy of TKIs. We then evaluated GFT NIBs and AG1478 inhibitory activities on SH2 GRB2 recruitment in real time kinetics. After an addition of an EC80 of EGF or epiregulin, time micromolar of both TKIs were added to each condition after 30 minutes of stimulation with agonists for the plasma membrane analysis and after one hour for the early endosome study. Responses were rapidly reversed within a few minutes at both the plasma membrane and at the endosomes, but showing different kinetics of inhibition between the two TKIs. The study of trafficking and signaling of RTKs in endosomes is essential as it has been proposed as an important mechanism producing drug resistance. It is thus necessary to properly examine and define the effects of therapeutics in such intracellular compartments. Finally, we evaluated the capacity to reverse EGF-mediated response with an anti-EGFR antibody, cetuximab. We observed those dependent effects in inhibiting SH2 GRB2 recruitment at the plasma membrane. This demonstrated that the RTK biosensor platform can also be used as a tool to screen for antibodies directed against RTKs. To examine the capacity of the platform to measure signaling of endogenously expressed RTKs, we used A431 human epidermoid carcinoma cells known to express high levels of EGFR. The recruitment of SH2 GRB2 effector to the plasma membrane was measured following stimulation of endogenous EGFR with EGF. We then evaluated the recruitment of this effector to the plasma membrane in real time after addition of EGF and its subsequent inhibition with gefitinib. Gefitinib rapidly reverses within two minutes the activity of endogenous EGFR. This data demonstrates the ability of our biosensor to detect signaling from endogenously expressed RTK, thus highlighting the capacity of the RTK platform to be transposed to pathophysiologically relevant cellular models. Overcoming mutations and resistance has become an important challenge when developing new therapeutics for the treatment of cancer. For example, glioblastoma, a very aggressive form of brain cancer with poor prognosis, presents multiple aberrant genomic alterations of EGFR that are responsible for disrupted signaling and resistance to therapies. Interestingly, deletion mutations in the EGFR extracellular domain are exclusively found in glioblastoma. On the other hand, some EGFR point mutations in the kinase domain were shown to occur largely in non-small cell lung carcinoma and are acquired mutations that arise during treatment with first and third generation EGFR TKIs. We will focus here on the impact of EGFR mutation on the signaling profiles and on inhibitors efficacies. First, using the biosensor RTK platform, we were able to show the effects of mutations on receptor trafficking. With the example of EGFR V4 and V5 mutants, which are commonly found in glioblastoma, we demonstrated that EGFR V4 and V5 mutants had a reduced capacity to internalize in comparison to EGFR wild type, despite being able to recruit PLCG1 at the plasma membrane, as demonstrated by a lack of breadth in the early endosomes. This observation may be linked to the absence of a phosphorylation site in those EGFR mutants, limiting the recruitment of a CCBL effector involved in receptor ubiquitination and internalization. The RTK biosensor platform can therefore help identify mutants impacting receptor trafficking from the plasma membrane to the endosomes. Using three different SH2 biosensors at the plasma membrane, we here compare the constitutive activities of different EGFR mutations commonly found in glioblastoma 
across three major pathways, MAP kinase, AKT, and PKC. We show that point mutation found in glioblastoma, such as EGFR, A289V and EGFR G598V confer constitutive activity on all pathways, while intrakinase deletions, such as in EGFR P4 and V5, had no effect on constitutive activity. Interestingly, binding site deletions, such as in EGFR V1 and V4, showed pathway specific constitutive activity. This allows to differentiate the ligand independent effects of various RTK mutations and to predict the constitutive activation of those mutants. To date, it is well demonstrated that RTK mutations can be oncogenic and also be implicated in drug resistance. Using the RTK biosensor and three different mutants found in lung carcinoma, we compare the effect in real time of two TKI first-generation gefitinib and third-generation ozimertinib on the recruitment of SH2 PLCG1 effector at the plasma membrane. We assessed that these two TKI were effective on the right type receptor, but not on the double mutant. As T790M is a mutation that appears during treatment with gefitinib, this TKI was ineffective on this mutation contrary to ozimertinib. The same observation was made with C797S mutation, where ozimertinib had no inhibitory effects. The platform can thus be exploited as a tool to develop next generation of TKI effective against different RTK variants. One other application that will be discussed today is EV breath imaging. The use of breath has been largely limited to spectrometric measurement because of the low luminescence output that limits the spatial frontal resolution required for high quality imaging. Recent advances in detection devices with higher sensitivity and more efficient breath probes such as those offered by EB Breath open new opportunities for the development of breath-based imaging tools. Egg 293 cells were co-transfected with the EGFR receptor and the luciferase tag effector GRB2 to monitor its recruitment at the plasma membrane or at the early endosomes, which are here RGFP tag compartments. Breath images were obtained in basal condition and after stimulation with 10 nanomolar of EGF. Breath was expressed as a heat map color code with the lowest signal being in blue and the highest shown in yellow and red. On the upper part of the slide, we illustrate using breath-based imaging the recruitment of SH2GRB2 effector at the plasma membrane. After a 10-minute incubation with EGF, breath signal increased at the plasma membrane, showing the recruitment of SH2GRB2. On the lower part of the slide, we demonstrate with breath imaging the internalization of SH2GRB2 effector into the endosomes. Indeed, after a one hour incubation with EGF, a strong increase of the breath signal was observed into endosomal compartments. These breath imaging results visually support the data described earlier at the plasma membrane and at the early endosomes and also confirm the proper localization of the measured breath signal. This highlights the possibility of transposing the RTK biosensor platform to microscopy. After the focus on EGFR to describe the wide potential and applications of the RTK biosensors, I am now going to present you a few examples of other RTK targets that were also studied and profiled with our biosensors. First, after a stimulation with BDNF, we observed the specific track B mediated recruitment of SH2 PLCG1 effector at the plasma membrane. This response could be reversed with the larotrectinib, a specific TKI directed against track B. As another example, after a stimulation with FGF1 peptidic ligand, we observed the specific FGFR1 mediated recruitment of SH2PLCG1 effector at the plasma membrane. This response could be reversed with PIN1, which is a potent TKI 
directed against the FGFR family. We then used two VEGFR2 ligands, the long and short version of VEGFA. The two ligands were able to induce the recruitment of SH2 PSCG1 effector at the plasma membrane, with the 121 AA being less potent than the 165 AA ligands. The response of VEGFR2 could be reversed with two different TKI against VEGFR, with axitinib being more potent than the ZM compound. Finally, we studied the effect of PDGFAB and BB ligands on the PGGFR beta receptor. The two ligands presented approximately the same potency with regard to the recruitment of SH2GRB2 and SH2PI3 kinase biosensor at the plasma membrane. However, the AA ligand was less efficient in recruiting SH2PI3 kinase at the plasma membrane. It shows the sensitivity of the biosensor platform to depict small differences in signaling using different ligands. The responses were reversed with two TKI, imatinib and AG1296, which both showed different potencies on the two presented pathways. We wanted to show you today, through these examples, the flexibility and variety of applications for which the platform can be used. To summarize, the technology offers several advantages. It offers the ability to work with unmodified RTK, which minimizes the introduction of artifacts into the studies. It also allows us to work with cell lines expressing high levels of the receptors of interest due to the high sensitivity of the assay. The technology displays the possibility to bring new insights to RTK by its capacity to evaluate different kinds of mode of action, whether it is with agonist or antagonist molecules, to extensively profile RTK signaling and to analyze the trafficking of RTK effectors. Importantly, these studies can be performed in real-time kinetics. Small molecule, peptides, or biologics can be profiled on the platform. It provides powerful tools for the analysis of RTK mutations and for the identification of novel generation of TKIs and antibodies directed against RTKs. It is also applicable to imaging and can be miniaturized for HTS campaigns. I would like to thank you all very much for your attention and we will be happy to take your questions. Florence, Laurent, wonderful presentations and data on the capabilities of the biosensor when it comes to receptor tyrosine kinase characterization. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. It was very, very educational. For the audience, the Q&A is going to begin in just a moment. So send your questions in now for Florence and Laurent. They're going to be on hand to answer, try to answer as many questions as they can. All you need to do to submit a question is Click the Ask a Question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and then hit Submit. Okay, we have a bunch of questions for our presenters, so let's get right to it. Bear with us for just a moment as we transition into the Q&A session. All right, everyone, let's start the uh, Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of questions here for uh, the team. Uh, first question from one of our audience members, guys, would like to know, can you provide evidence that demonstrates the translatability of the obtained data from recombinant systems to primary cells? Uh, yes, of course. So, uh, so, so the tool is primarily intended for in vitro pharmacology purposes uh, at first. So we did show in the presentation that the RTK biosensors can be used in traditional transfection models such as HEX-293 cells, which was the bulk of the information that was presented. But we can also be transposed in other cell lines, such as carcinoma cells, where we were moreover able to measure endogenous EGFR signaling. And I think there was a question that came to that effect. So if a cell can be transfected, we can assume the data can be generated in other cell systems, such as primary cell lines. We have also developed an EB-BRET-based biosensors for the study of GPCRs. 
we can provide to publications uh, which have demonstrated the observations made with our gpcr biosensors which showed that they were predictive of outcomes measured in physiologically relevant systems so uh, i could point you to one recent publication uh, in eye science it's a uh, titled Bias Signaling of the Mu Opioid Receptor, which revealed in native uh, neurons. And this was published in April 2019. So if you want to look that up, that will provide you with a uh, uh, GI biased agonist, which including buprenorphine, and further show highly correlated drug activities in two very distinct experimental systems. All right, great, thanks guys. Uh, next question, um, from the panel of the 12 SH2 biosensors you describe, uh, that you described in the webinar, um, have they also been validated with different receptor tyrosine kinase targets? Uh, yes, so also we've shown just examples here of uh, the application to other RPKs. Most of uh, our SH2 biosensors have been validated with other targets. Of course, the SH2 domain containing has to be recruited by the RPK in question after stimulation with its ligands. Uh, we can nonetheless specify here that as for EGFR that was used uh, as an example in this webinar, data were also generated with all 12 uh, SH2 biosensors uh, on the PG, PG GFR uh, beta receptor also. All righty, and next question for uh, you two guys as well is, uh, uh, audience member would like to know, besides the biosensors you introduced today, uh, do you have the possibility to study receptor tyrosine kinase heterodimerization? Uh, we usually work essentially with uh, non-modified receptors, but uh, we have also the possibility to tag the receptors with uh, some fluorophores such as L2 or RGFP in order to study uh, RPK heterodimerization by breadth. Uh, furthermore, we have also the capacity to work with air loop tagged receptors to directly follow their trafficking from the plasma membrane into different cellular compartments, such as early or late endosomes, or also slow or fast recycling vesicles. All righty. Um, next question. Uh, does your T790M EGFR mutant also carry primary mutation, for example, L858R? So uh, the mutant here we use in our study uh, does not carry any other mutation, uh, but we have the possibility to study mutants uh, that are arboring more than one mutation. All right, thank you very much, Florence. And it looks like we have one last question here. Um, what do you advise, so what advice do you, so, I'm sorry, what do you advise to check protein uh, tyrosine kinase activity in clinical trials uh, with the objective to enhance instead of inhibit or objective efficacy of treatment of ischemia reperfusion injuries? So, I mean, with, with the biosensors and the, the platform that was presented, uh, you could study both enhancement of activity, but also inhibition, which was mainly presented today. The, the question uh, is more about ensuring that there's no high basal level of activity to, in order to distinguish, to be able to still see the signal of enhancement of activity, but that would be uh, something that could be done uh, on this platform, indeed. All right, great, thanks guys. And with that, it looks like we've come to the end of our webinar. So if you missed any parts of the webinar or you'd like to watch it again or you'd like to forward the link to your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend, just know that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website for up to a year. That's at genengenews.com. Um, I'd like to thank Florence and Laurent again for their very informative presentations. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Domain Therapeutics for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully we'll see you again at another GEN webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you.